Good evening and welcome. Tonight I'm going to be flipping through this book and reading all the little boxes. In this book about Turkey, a couple of disclaimers real quick. This is a very old book. It's from, I think, 2003. A lot has changed in Turkey since then, so if anything's outdated, I'm not going to bother reading it. Hey, this is Editing ASMR Geographica here. I apparently rambled for way too long about accents and things. So, in a nutshell, I apologize for anything that's mispronounced. Or if there's any, you know, accents missing and I can't say it right, I do mess up a lot in this video. So, just forgive me. I checked out this book because, first of all, look at that. Sophia here, so beautiful. Let's dive right in. I checked out this book because I read the history chapters for my channel members, but then I saw all the cool boxes and thought, there's some good boxes in here. Let's, let's read the little guy. Here's a guy, he's got some, I think it's coffee here that he serves to people as he carries it around on his back. Very Turkish. Here we have like a little cafe down here. The caption says this is a 7th century mosque, which is really incredible. I love that. And here's some spices here. Pretty sure Istanbul has the world's largest spice market. I read that somewhere. Now this is cool. This is part of a museum, but most of the exhibits are underwater, so they built the museum on top of the water, so you can look in through the glass and see all of the underwater treasures down there. How cool is that? That's in uh, Bodrum. The beautiful beach, another thing Turkey's known for. Gorgeous, gorgeous beaches. Here's Mount Nemrut with these incredible heads here. There's a lot of cool facts about Mount Nemrut. One of them is that these heads don't belong here, they belong up, like on, on these things, but they've been destroyed in earthquakes. So the heads have been abraded as best as they could. The other cool thing, there's a box later, but I don't know if it mentions it. You see this mound back here? This is a tomb to the king that Mount Nimrud is dedicated to. And they built this tomb and then they stacked all of these rocks on top. So if you tried to dig into the rocks to get to the tomb, you would crumble everything around it, and it would destroy the tomb. So there's a tomb under this mound here that we can't access. There you go. Because it would be destroyed if we tried. It's probably full of all kinds of treasures and things. How cool is that? I think that's a really neat fact. There's a rock salesman here, showing off some rocks, and typical market here. All kinds of things for sale. It looks like those like little belly dancer skirts and what they're called. Some silver plates maybe. Lots of clothes, lots of little trinkets. Very cool. And here's a map of Turkey. That's where it's located in the world. Beautiful rolling landscape. And here's a view from above. You can see the little straits that separate Europe from Asia, from the Mediterranean to the Black Sea. And another picture of the coast here. Here's a cool road. It reminds me of California. Let's read our first box. It says Ford of the Cow. The name Bosporus means Ford of the Cow in Greek. According to legend, Bosporus Strait got its name when the goddess Hera sent a swarm of gnats to irritate another goddess named Io. In order to escape her tormentor, Io swam the strait and gave it its name. I don't think they tell you that. Uh, Zeus turned Io into a cow. <laughs> Try to hide her. That's the name of the cow. In 1914, Turkey lost control of the Bosporus. Then, in 1936, the Montreux Convention 
which regulated the passage of ships through the Bosporus and the Dardanelles Straits gave back military control of it to Turkey. At that time, about 100 to 150 ships passed through the strait each year. Now that number is fast approaching 50,000 per year, thanks to the exportation of oil. A bridge links the Asian and European sides of the strait. You can see it over here. I'm sure this is cool, like castle fortress thing happening here. I don't know if that's a tiny little box right here that says the Black Sea runs over. In the summer of 1998, it just kept raining in eastern Turkey. As reported on August 12th, the Black Sea finally overflowed and flooded the area. Ten people were killed, dozens were missing, and more than 50 homes were destroyed. The rains came again in December of that year. Hundreds of people had to be evacuated, and a hotel collapsed. You don't really think of huge bodies of water flooding like that, do you? Beautiful meadow here, isn't that lovely? It says the Black Sea regions would landscape here. Oh, you know what this is? Let's look at the caption. This is Troy. As in Helen of Troy. As in Trojan Horse. It's Troy. Now these are cool. This is in Cappadocia. You can see some of the uh, fairy rocks here. Chimney rocks that people have carved little homes inside. It's so like quaint, isn't it? We've got some hay here in this desert here. This says the city of Iskenderun. In the Hatay province, located on a narrow section of land that reaches south in Turkey's southern plains region, is the city of Iskenderun. In this historical city, Alexander the Great and his army of 35,000 men conquered Persian Emperor Darius the Great's army of 100,000 way back in 333 BCE. To celebrate, Alexander founded this city and named it Alexandretta after who else? Himself. The city, now known as Iskenderun, has a population of more than 150,000 today. It is a busy commercial center and port with a fine harbor. Big box here that says when the earth shakes. The early morning hours of August 17th, 1999 were quiet in the western Turkish city of Izmit. The quiet was suddenly broken at 3.02 a.m. when Turkey's second strongest recorded earthquake hit, measuring 7.0 on the Richter scale. The terrifying quake lasted 45 seconds. In those seconds, it destroyed almost 300,000 homes and 40,000 businesses. More than 500,000 people were left homeless. Almost 20,000 people died, and more than three times that number were injured. Roads were cut off completely. Communication became impossible, and an oil refinery went up in flames. The following months brought more than 1,300 aftershocks. On November 12th, a nearby area was hit again with a stronger earthquake that measured 7.2 on the Richter scale. Almost 900 people died in this disaster, 5,000 were injured, and an additional 80,000 were left homeless. On February 3rd, 2002, Turkey shook again when an earthquake measuring 6.2 hit the province of Afyon, southeast of Istanbul. It hit just after 9 a.m. The quake left villages, villagers homeless, along with 45 people dead and 170 injured. Aftershocks followed, some measuring as high as 5.3 on the Richter scale. Unfortunately, Turkey is becoming well known for its earthquake sits directly on a major fault zone, and has experienced eight large quakes, measuring 7.0 or higher in the last 60 years, 80 in the last century. The majority take place 
on the western branch of the 750-mile-long Anatolian Fault, located in the eastern Marmara region. Despite this history, the government was completely unprepared for 1999's disaster and had to depend almost entirely on volunteers for most of the rescue efforts. The Turkish government's slow response for relief effort was heavily criticized all over the world. How strange that that history repeated itself there in 2023. Um, that earthquake occurred around here. And kind of the same thing. They were unprepared. They had to rely on relief, and so on and so forth. But moving on, look at this sad picture here of destruction. Moving on, here's a geographical map of Turkey. You can see how extremely mountainous it is. There's the Taurus Mountains, Pontic Mountains, Stamboul's over here, the capital and cars over and lakes as well. Looking at Turkey's cities. Let's see. I think it has a separate box for Istanbul, so it's not going to talk about it here. But let's look at some other cities. Antalya is located on the southern coast of Turkey. Situated on a natural harbor, it it is has long stretches. <laughs> it has long stretches of beautiful beaches that draw people from all over the world. While the population is usually around 1.5 million, that number swells by 300,000 to 500,000 during the summer season. Antalya is considered to be one of the most beautiful cities in Turkey. U.S. Navy ships can often be seen docked in its bay. Bursa, the fourth largest city in Turkey with almost 2 million people, it's located 145 miles south of Istanbul. The city is dwarfed by Mount Ulu's 8,377-foot peaks. Thought of as the heart of Turkish industry, Bursa is a mixture of modern factories and warehouses and historical landmarks. The Yeshilkan Green Mosque. Oh, I forget, C's have a weird sound in Turkish. I forget. It'll talk about it later. <laughs> the Green Mosque. And other examples of early Ottoman architecture are located here. Bodrum is situated on a peninsula. This town is the yachting center of Turkey. The area is famous for building a special kind of wooden hulled yacht called a gullet. Its landmarks include the Castle of St. Peter and the Bodrum Museum of Underwater Archaeology. Tourists from all over the world visit Bodrum during the summer months. I need to move a cord real quick. Okay, one second. Okay, that didn't help. Oh, me. I'm sorry. You can't see anything that's happening, but anyway. Eterna, which is called the Gateway to Europe, is near the Bulgarian border. Its population is around 400,000 has an interesting bazaar and is home to Selimia Khan. I can't remember what I'm saying. The mosque that an architect named Sinan considered to be his masterpiece. Istanbul. We're going to talk about Istanbul. Istanbul, the biggest and best known city in Turkey, is an incredible mixture of culture and religion. It is also the only city in the world that is located in two continents. Originally called Byzantium, its name was changed to Constantinople by Constantine I, and then finally to Istanbul. The population of Istanbul is young. More than half of its 9 million people are less than 25 years old. Istanbul combines the most modern buildings and businesses with some of the most impressive landmarks in the country, including the Blue Mosque, the Bosporus Bridge, the Hagia Sophia, and the Egyptian Spice Market. Izmir is Turkey's third largest city, with a population of almost 3.1 million. It is home to Turkey's second largest port. Many of Izmir's most impressive historical buildings were destroyed in earthquakes, 
and in a big fire in 1922. It was also the center of the destructive 1999 earthquake. Izmir is close to some famous historical sites, such as the ruins of Ephesus and Troy. This is Darren Kuyu, an underground tale. Isn't that cool? That's in Cappadocia as well, I believe. Let's see. This is along Lake Vaughan. Huge lake. I think you can see it on my map here. Lake Vaughan's right there. Big, big lake in Turkey. Pretty sure it's the largest. And some beautiful trees look like they're changing for the season. Pretty. In praise of tulips. If you heard that, that's the wire. Being in that city. Oh, goodness. Okay. In praise of tulips. The national flower of Turkey is the tulip. As early as 1000 CE, records show that tulips were being grown in Turkey. In the 13th century, a Turkish poet named Rumi wrote praises of tulips in his poems. The reign of Sultan Ahmed II was known as the tulip period. Ambassadors were sent to Europe to watch other cultures and bring back new ideas, including planting tulips in home gardens to make them appear more elegant. Tulips are really pretty. And there's some bright poppies as well. There's a box. That's the full pages, my goodness. About national parks. Heading out to the national park. The first national park in Turkey was established in 1958. Since then, the number of national and natural parks and forests has continued to grow. Forty years ago, anyone who tried to visit Nemrut Mountain, a national park in the eastern part of Turkey, would have been in for quite a difficult trip. Located on the country's fifth highest peak, at about 7,000 feet, Nemrut could only be reached on foot or by donkey. They spent at least a two-day trip. Thanks to a paved pathway today, however, travelers can get there by car or bus, unless it's between the 1st of October and the 1st of May, when the park is closed due to snow. The trip is worth it, even with the ever-present chill. The park is a funeral monument to King Antiochus I, a rather vain ruler of the Comagene Kingdom in the 1st century BCE. At the summit, visitors are greeted by the regal heads of many gods and kings that Antiochus had his workers carve and place facing the east and the west. Antiochus's own face is included, along with those of the Greek gods Apollo, Zeus, and Hercules, because Antiochus thought of himself as their equal. Each head is taller than the average man and seems to watch the world go by in silence. Experts consider Nemrut Mountain to be a feat of engineering that compares to the ancient pyramids of Egypt. No one knows how the workers were able to drag these incredibly heavy statues thousands of feet up the mountain without modern machinery. Located outside the city of Antalya, Kopulu Canyon National Park is part of Sel Selja Canyon, that's how you say it, which extends to the Mediterranean coast. The landscape within the park is breathtaking, ranging from clear, white-capped waters to fairy chimneys and other rock formations. The ancient city of Selja, I guess so, like Seljuk, Selja, which still contains its original theater, is found there backdrop of the snow-capped peaks of the Kuyusuk Mountains is designed by nature. The Olympus Bay Doglari National Park is on the Mediterranean coast near Antalya. It features mountains 6,000 feet tall, a wonderful beach, and ruins to explore. In the spring, the park truly comes alive as the lavender and roses bloom, attracting colorful butterflies. Another unique feature of this park is the sheer waters found there. These oceanic birds fly around the park in large flocks. Unique to Turkey. Let's see. 
Turkey has a number of animals that live nowhere else. They include a species of pheasant um, called Phasianus colchicus, and a type of wild sheep called Ovis musimon anatolica. The Anatolia leopard is also found only in Turkey. There's some flamingos. See the bed the birds is cross. In the month of May, bird watchers of all ages clean off their binoculars and get ready to see some incredible sights as migration season begins. Sultan Sasligi, a complex of freshwater marshes, salt lakes, and mudflats just southeast of Cappadocia, is the crossroads of two migration routes. In May, it's easy to spot more than 300 different bird species flying overhead in numbers that mount up to more than 700,000. About a quarter of these birds stop and nest in the area. The two dozen wetlands found throughout Turkey provide shelter for more than 25,000 birds. Light of the Storm Twice a year, the skies over Istanbul are filled with the breathtaking sight and sound of migrating storks. The Bosporus Strait, a 22-mile-long channel of water that divides the continents of Europe and Asia and Turkey, is part of their annual migration route. For several weeks each spring and fall, Istanbul's skies play host to more than a quarter of a million storks, flying from one area of the world another. Those who stay to breed build huge nests in minarets, on rooftops, and atop telephone poles. A big old stork nest. These scientists are watching a turtle lay some eggs. Let's read about the unusual. Let's see. Among all the animals found in Turkey, some are quite unique and endangered. The bald ibis, for example, is close to being extinct. One of the world's two remaining nesting places for the bald ibis is located in the bird sanctuary near Urfa, mid-February to early July. I'm pretty sure this is bald and not bald. Yeah, okay, bald. <laughs> the major wetlands within Turkey also provide shelter to endangered birds, such as the Dalmatian pelican, the pygmy cormorant, and the slender billed curlew, as well as to plants including buttercups, water mint, water lilies, and tamarisks. In eastern Turkey is Lake Van, the country's largest inland body of water, and one of the world's largest lakes. Living there are the mysterious and strange Van cats. Look at the Van cats. These fluffy white creatures often have one blue eye and one green eye. Unlike domestic cats, they love to go swimming and often dive into the large lake just for the fun of it. Their species is endangered, but an organization called the Von Cat Research Institute is helping to turn that around. A number of Turks keep Von Cats as pets in their homes. Around the mountainous town of Kongal lives a type of work dog that is bred specifically to protect flocks of livestock from hungry packs of wolves or bears that might be roaming the area. Called Anatolian Congol dogs, these strong dogs would intimidate any animal. They reach about waist high on the average adult to weigh up to 135 pounds. Considered to be Turkey's national breed, these powerful dogs have come to the attention of breeders all over the world. They are very good-natured animals, but are fiercely protective, as anyone who gets between them and their flocks will quickly find out. Some families in Turkey keep these dogs as pets. The government recently made it illegal to export the dogs without a license. There they are. Good doggies. There's a monk seal. A little sad. Let's read the history section. This is Perga ancient Roman city. And these are, this is the Gate of Lions in Hattusas. That's, you can see the lions are still going to that. Let's 
some Hittite text, the early peoples who lived in what's now Turkey. Let's read about the legend of Troy. Once thought to be just a legend handed down for generations through the stories of Homer's, the Iliad, and the Odyssey, and the familiar tale of the Trojan horse, the real city of Troy was rediscovered in the 19th century. It is near Chanakali, in the northwestern part of Anatolia. There were almost 3,000 years of continual settlement in Troy, which historians have divided into nine eras. The first was in 3000 to 2400 BCE, and the last ended in 334 BCE. This unique area has given scientists the chance to explore the cultural development of a single site over a huge period of time, a rare opportunity. And yes, the Trojan horse of many stories is indeed in Troy. It isn't the original one, however. Instead, it is a model made from images found on coins and pottery excavated on the site. So there's a real Trojan horse there? That's so cool. I mean, obviously, we're about to. Now, this picture fascinated me. This is the Hippodrome in Constantinople, where they would have, like, chariot races and other sporting events. But look in the center. There's all these columns representing different parts of the world. So you have an Egyptian pyramid, I assume some Greek columns, Roman column, there's a Aksumite obelisk, there's Meroe pyramids, like all different kinds of different structures from around the world. Isn't that neat? I like that picture. The early Ottoman Empire. So here you can see in red the size of the Ottoman Empire in 1355. Then we get to all this area by 1453. That's when Constantinople was conquered. This is conquered lands 1453 to 1520. All this area here, Crimea, Bosnia, Egypt, Levant, Syria, the rest of Anatolia, parts of Armenia, Kurdistan. And then the conquered lands between 1520 and 1680. We've got Bulgaria, Pondonia, okay? there. We've got the rest of Armenia, Kurdistan, what's now like Azerbaijan, lots of Iraq down there. Um, we've got um, more Africa there, Tunisia, Algeria, etc. Et Huge empire of its time. There's Constant Constantinople getting sacked in 1453. Let's read this box about a traveling man. All he wanted to do in his entire life was travel, and that is exactly what he did. Evlia bin Dervis Mehmet Sili was born in 1611 in Istanbul. From his earliest days, he knew that he wanted to explore the world. His father was an artist who had served his m many sultans of his lifetime. Sorry, I almost hiccuped. He was almost a talented storyteller who filled his son's ears with endless adventure stories that fed the boy's passion to travel. Silly began by exploring every nook and cranny of his hometown until there wasn't a corner of it he didn't know or a person he hadn't spent time talking with. Then in 1640, he went to Bursa, followed by a sea voyage to his meet. His journeys had just begun. For the next forty years, Silly fought in battles, traveled by boat and foot, and even became the chief muezzin and accountant of Melik Ahmed Pasha, governor of the western regions of the Ottoman Empire. With Pasha, he explored all of Europe. Silly wrote about his explorations in a nearly six thousand page book called Book of Travels still read today and allows the armchair traveler to share in Silly's undying passion to see foreign lands. Here we have this cool map. Let's read about it. It says map maker. It's a mystery that has yet to be solved. P. 
Piri race, an admiral in the Turkish fleet during the 16th century, loved to draw maps. Studying others' maps and then creating his own was his favorite thing to do. In the process, he created a mystery that scientists still have not been able to solve. In 1513, Piri race drew a map of the world based on what he had seen himself and what he had been told by other travelers. The original map wasn't found until hundreds of years later in 1929. It amazed cartographers or map makers around the world. The map showed the northern coast of Antarctica, which is incredible because Antarctica wasn't discovered until 1818, some 300 years later. To add to the mystery, his map also had correct longitudes for Antarctica, and they weren't discovered until the late 1770s. Piri Reis's maps are still considered to be some of the most amazing in the world. That's neat. There is a mystery behind that, isn't there? We've got the Young Turks here, fighting for their independent country, which they eventually would get thanks to this guy. Um, fifth from left. Right. This guy? I guess so. Yeah, he's, he's holding up a card for you to add a turkey to. I just realized I have a note in here that I wrote for my channel members. Updated history stuff. <laughs> but here we've got some fighting jets for the Gulf War. I'm gonna move this so we can read this box. We look inside the top copy palace and the imperial treasury. Located in Istanbul, the top copy palace was built in the 15th century and used by sultans and their families for more than four centuries. At one time, 50,000 people lived and worked there. It is the oldest and largest palace in the world. From the outside, it looks much like a fort high walls surrounding all the buildings. The top copy palace is divided into three main areas. The beer room or outer palace, the inner room or inner palace, and the harem or courtyards. At one time it even had its very own zoo. The palace contains gardens, endless courtyards connected by gateways, and the oldest Byzantine church in the entire city. The imperial treasuries found within Topkapi Palace. It holds such riches as the world rarely sees, including ivory book covers, slabs of emeralds, and the fifth largest diamond in the world, weighing in at 84 carats. Government chapter, so that's going to be outdated. There's Ataturk right there. Whoever was in charge when this book came out. National Assembly meeting there. We're not going to read out the Turkish National Anthem. But we are going to read about the Turkish flag. The Crescent and the Star. The flag of Turkey, adopted in 1936, was designed with the traditional Islamic symbols of a white crescent moon and a five-pointed star on a red background. Red was used to represent the color of the Ottoman Empire. The national motto is this here. It translates to peace at home, peace in the world. I like that. Some soldiers there. Let's read about the father of the Turks, Mustafa Kemal. Anyone who happens to be standing in Turkey on November 10th at 9.05 in the morning will notice something decidedly unusual. Everyone, from people on the sidewalks and drivers in the streets, to people eating in restaurants and executives making presentations, stops what they are doing and stands silent for one minute. This is done to honor one of Turkey's and the world's most esteemed leaders, Mustafa Kemal, or Ataturk, the father of the Turks. He died on this date, 1938. He could be described as Turkey's version of George Washington. But anyway, born in 1930, 
born in 1881, Ataturk was a leader who did more to change and improve his country than almost any person in history. In 1923, he founded the Turkish Republic and was quickly elected its first president, a job that he held until his death 15 years later. In those years, he managed to change things within Turkey's social, political, legal, economic, and cultural life. He led his nation to full independence, ended the Ottoman dynasty, which had been in control for more than six centuries, rewrote the constitution, outlawed polygamy, and gave women the right to vote. These changes were felt everywhere, from the language people spoke to the way they worshipped. Ataturk's image is seen all over Turkey, from portraits on the wall of every government building to most homes to statues and parks and on most denominations of money. One hundred years after his birth, at the Ataturk Centennial, the U.S. White House issued a statement that said, Mustafa Kemal was a great leader in times of war and peace. One of the quotes for which he is best known reflects this, I look to the world with an open heart, full of pure feelings and friendship. Got some more boxes here. Tansu Chile. A woman of ambition, Tansu Çiller, was Turkey's first female prime minister. Born in 1943 in Istanbul, Çiller's career in politics began in 1990 when she became the assistant to the chairman of the True Path Party, Suleyman Demirel. De Demirel. She served as prime minister from 1993 to 1995. I'm sure I butchered her name. I'm so sorry. Ataturk's address. Oh, this is a speech. We're not gonna speeches. Let's read about Ankara. Did you know this? Ankara is a city that has seen incredible growth in the last 80 years. While it was once a small town of 20,000, today it has more than 3.6 million people. Located in the north-central Anatolia region, Ankara was chosen as Turkey's capital in 1923 by Ataturk. He wanted a city that had no connection with the Ottomans, and that was centrally located within the country. Ankara is a classic example of how Turkey is both modern and ancient. In the heart of the city is Kizile, with high-rise buildings, shops, and an underground railway system. In other parts of the city are the Haman, Roman baths, and the Antikabir, or mausoleum. Ataturk. Indeed, Ankara is the place to go for museums. It is home to the Museum of Anatolian Civilization, the Independence War Museum, the Museum of the Republic, and the Ethnography Museum for the study of specific cultures, to name a few. When I covered Ankara on my channel, we went to a couple of those places. Definitely the, the mausoleum. Ooh, big smoky. Looks like an oil refinery of some kind. It doesn't say. And, um, got some corn. That's a lot of corn. That's a lot of wheat. My goodness. Busy, busy farmers. Um, there's some tobacco farms here. They're picking tobacco. But this map up here is a resources map. You can see the mining there. All the different colors are different types of farmland, except the greens are forests. Those magic carpets. Turkey is known all over the world for its carpets. Made in vibrant colors with striking patterns and shapes, these carpets appeal to people of many different ages, tastes, and backgrounds. Even the famous Italian traveler Marco Polo was recorded as commenting on their beauty when he passed through Anatolia in the 13th century. While many carpets are sold to tourists, Turks use them for simple floor coverings, room curtains, covers for large cushions, or prayer rugs. Turkish carpet designs and styles are often handed down from mother to daughter. 
the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul is considered one of the best places in the country to find a genuine Turkish carpet. There are also carpet centers in central Anatolia and the coastal regions. Shoppers in search of a special rug look for various things, like how thick the weave is, how much silk and or wool is in it, and what kinds of dyes were used. The oldest Turkish carpets known of today were discovered in Konya early in the 12th century. Wo woven more than 700 years ago, they are now on display in Istanbul. Historians believe that carpets date all the way back to the 4th century BCE. It was the Seljuks who supposedly made carpet weaving into an official business. Today, a small number of women in Turkey still spend many long winter months weaving these beautiful rugs. The process begins with the wool. While well, most wool is mass-produced in factories, it is still possible to see a shepherd spinning raw wool while he tends his flocks. Dyeing is next. Originally, the dyes were made from natural products available at the time. Leaves, bark, flowers, roots, and minerals. Now, artificial dyes are also imported from nearby countries. Weavers can change the shade of the dye by adding ingredients such as yogurt, lemon juice, or salt to the mixture. The area of Gorim in Cappadocia has a training center that teaches people the ancient art of carpet weaving, and it is open to the public. The Dolbak project in western Turkey has also been established to show women how to use the traditional design. little help from tourists. Turkey has made truly amazing progress in tourism, which is part of the service sector of the economy. People travel to and within this country to see its numerous sites and treasures. Not only does Turkey have ancient ruins and other historical places to visit, but it usually has as many as 150 archaeological digs going on historic sites at any one time. Miles of beautiful coastline and seas bring vacationers from all over the world. Recently, there has been increasing interest in specialty types of travel, such as mountain climbing, white water rafting, fishing, and more. The government has responded to this interest by investing in the construction of hotels and restaurants and developing various travel packages. In 1992, the number of foreign visitors to Turkey was almost 6 million, creating revenues of almost 3 billion US dollars. This number continues to rise. Turkey had more than 10 million visitors in 2000, local revenues of almost 8 million US dollars. There's a thesis up here, very, very famous ancient site. Turkish lira. Actually, I'm going to skip this because it talks about how much they're all worth, and it's definitely different now. Let's see. Busy day. Danger on the road. Let's see what this says. In spite of the limited number of cars on the road, Turkey still has a relatively high accident rate thanks to narrow, curving roads, bumpy surfaces, and potholes. Animals are known to wander into the road now and then. Many motorcycle riders and farmers driving massive farm equipment don't turn their lights on at all. Or they wait until they see another vehicle heading their way. Oh, that's so dangerous. Then they flash their lights on quickly, startling oncoming drivers. The police are beginning to hand out more tickets and fines for traffic errors in an attempt to bring more order and safety to the roads. We have... Some very kind looking old ladies here. Oh, look, they're in Cappadocia. You can see the fairy chimneys behind them. Busy day here in Ankara. A school ritual. We'll skip that. I, I have weird feelings about like things you recite at school. That's, I don't know. We're not going to talk about it today. There's Istanbul. 
There's some Kurdish people here. Looks like they're out with their um, horses, from what I can tell. Grammar, grammar. Okay, this is going to tell me how to pronounce things. While the Turkish language is considered difficult to learn, it helps that each letter is almost always pronounced the same way, unlike English. What a concept. The most challenging letter is C, which is pronounced like an English J. That's what it's pronounced like a J. For example, the word for mosque is pronounced Jami. See, I knew it was different. Jami. If you've already left a comment about it, I'm sorry. The Turks have an I without a dot. Without a dot, it's pronounced like er. The English born to know. Shout out to my channel member, Krista. The most confusing part of the language might be that suffixes are added to the root of a word to change its meaning. For example, bay rock means flag, bay rock tar means flag bearer, and bay rock taroglu means son of a flag bearer. We'll skip all the words and phrases. There's examples of Turkish with English there for the Turkish. beautiful church here. And let's read about how these churches got built. There's Constantine the First, the Great. It's little wonder that the Roman Emperor known as Constantine went by the name of Constantine the First, the Great. His official name was Flavius Valerius Aurelius Constantinus, the first emperor of Rome to become a Christian. He was born in the year 275 and died in 337. While he was in power, Christians in the region that is now Turkey once again had freedom to worship, and the Christian church was legalized. Property that had been taken from the Christians was returned. Constantine rebuilt Byzantium, renamed it Constantinople, and made it the capital. Today that city is called Istanbul. Constantine built the first great Christian cathedral along with other churches near Rome and in Turkey. When Constantine died, his empire was passed on to his sons, Constantius, Constans, and Constantine II. Okay. Uh, pulling a George Foreman there, I guess. There's a Quran all set up there. That's about the Prophet Muhammad. We'll skip that. We want to talk about Turkey, right? Talking about Turkey, right? A tour of the Green Mosque and the Green Tomb. Jami, you have to remember Jami. It's hard to miss the Yesil Jami, a Green Mosque, in the city of Bursa. Built in 1419 by Mehmed I, an early Ottoman Sultan, it is an awesome site. Its dome rises high above all of the surrounding buildings. Delicate carvings and turquoise, green, white, and blue tiles are spread throughout a variety of designs, from geometric patterns to circles and stars. An inscription inside states in Persian that the tiles are the work of the expert craftsmen of Tabriz, which is in Iran today. The outside is almost entirely made out of marble. Nearby is the Yesu Turba green tomb. Also built in 1419 and covered with green tiles, it is considered to be one of the most beautiful buildings in all of Bursa. The onion-shaped minaret caps and brick and stone exterior are nothing compared to the interior. The ornately decorated sarcophagus or stone coffin in it belonged to Mehmet I. It is empty because Muslim law forbids burial above. Some whirling dervishes here. A branch of, I'm gonna say it's Sufism. Sufism, I'm reading it down here. Sufism. Um, that's their form of prayer. We're gonna skip some Rumi phrases there, even though everyone should read some Rumi at some point. Looks like a family out having a picnic here. And they're playing some, oh, it's Oki. I thought it was gonna be like Majo. This guy's really enthusiastic about his tea. <laughs> I love when people paint their faces like that. 
or soccer or football, right? Right, this guy's playing a sport. I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but um, an ancient horsey sport. Oil one up. Anyone looking for a little fun in Turkey in the summertime can watch a unique game called Yagli Gurus, or Greased Wrestling. The rules are similar to regular wrestling. A wrestler loses when his shoulder is forced to the ground, or he gives up. In Yagli Gurish, however, there is one definite difference. Contestants put on a pair of leather pants and then cover their entire bodies with olive oil. Trying to pin someone who is that slippery makes the game much more challenging. This type of game is thought to have begun in 1360 as a way to train soldiers to stay fit and quick. Today, it's one of Turkey's favorite summer sports. In late June or early July, at the Kirkpinar Festival near Derna, more than 1,000 boys and men compete in four divisions, young boys, mid-height, full height, and complete height. Referees keep watch, and the average match lasts about 30 minutes, although they have been known to go on for as long as three hours. The winner's the last man standing or sliding. I can't imagine wrestling someone for more than 30 minutes. That sounds exhausting. Let's read about Pocket Hercules. His name is Naim Sule Manoglu, but he's lovingly called the Pocket Hercules. Because he's only 4 foot 11 inches tall, it's a meter and a half, and it weighs in a little less than 140 pounds, it's hard to imagine this man winning an Olympic gold medal in weightlifting, let alone three of them. That is exactly what he has done, though. Naim has made his country incredibly proud by taking home gold medals in the 1988, 1992, and 1996 Olympics Games. He even set a new world's record by lifting an unbelievable combination weight of 738.5 pounds more than five times his own body weight. I don't get how that's possible. How do you lift so much more than your body weight? Some traditional music there and beautiful costumes. Let's see, Tarkin world. You know, you might skip pop stars of the day. I'm sure that's very outdated. Though I love pop stars. Belly dancer here. This is probably super jangly. The amphitheater, the city of Selçuk, is located on the west coast of Turkey. There's an accent on that one, Selçuk. One of its biggest attractions is an ancient amphitheater. It can seat an incredible 25,000 people. Despite its age, it's still used for concerts today. Let's see. Hmm. I think we can skip all the film stuff, to be, to be honest, even though... I love film. We're gonna... I want to stick more to stuff like this. Sinan in the Hagia Sophia. Born in Anatolia in 1489, Mimar Kosa Sinan, I hope, is considered to be the greatest architect of the Ottoman Empire. He was in charge of designing and building over 300 structures in Istanbul alone. Between 1538 and 1588, he created incredible masterpieces and lent his talents to everything from mosques, fountains, and palaces, to chapels, tombs, harems, and hospitals. One of Sinan's greatest achievements can be found in his renovation of Istanbul's Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom. A Turkish historical tale tells how thousands of candles used to be lit inside and their bright flames would reflect off of the marble walls so strongly that the building was used as a lighthouse. Whether that's true or not, the Hagia Sophia is considered a world landmark. It was designed by two mathematicians, Athenius of Trauis and Isidorus of Miletus, and it took six years to build. Dedicated in 536, the building has already been through an earthquake which sent its dome crashing to the floor, as well as destruction by 13th century Catholic soldiers. 
The church is huge, measuring 183 feet high and 105 feet all four sides. Sinan added four towers under Mehmet II's orders. In 1932, Ataturk declared the Hagia Sophia a museum. Turks still debate today whether the building should be turned back into a church or kept open as a museum for tourists to visit. For now, tourists continue to walk through to see the stained glass windows and religious mosaics. They can even walk to the marble square where Byzantine emperors were once crowned and see the library of Sultan Mehmed I built in the 1730s. Spoiler alert, it's a mosque today. It's no longer officially a museum, but I'm pretty sure you can still come in and see all the historical parts of it. Like you can in lots of like cathedrals and religious buildings around the world. Lots of pretty bowls here. I like this one that has the flag on it. It's a famous author. I think we're going to skip the popular Turkish writers too. This Nasruddin Hoca. Very, very famous. Um, I don't know how to describe it. I guess literary figure? One day Hoca lost his donkey. While looking for it, he prayed and thanked God. Why are you so grateful when you've lost your precious donkey? He was asked. I'm happy because I was not riding the animal at the time. Otherwise, I would have been lost too. <laughs> Stories like that. You know, like tall tales, silly... Um, like wise fool kind of stories. Let's talk more about that. This is meeting black eye, and I'm probably gonna mispronounce the things in this too, but feel free to correct me like I need. His shadow is reflected on the stage, and already people in the audience are smiling. His name is Karagos or Black Eye, and he is a puppet and has been a part of Turkish entertainment since the fourteenth century. History says that the character of Karagas first appeared during the 14th century. He was rude, illiterate, and a real troublemaker. His best buddy, Hasvad, Hasvad, was always around to get him into trouble. The two of them continued to make up the Turkish entertainment of shadow puppet theater. A stage is set, and then a muslin curtain is hung in front. An oil lamp is placed behind the stage. When the puppets come out, their shadows show up against the curtain, sharp and clear. The puppeteer is called a karagazosu, and he works all of the puppets alone. His assistant hands him the puppets, while the yardok sings the songs that are part of the story, and the diarizin plays the tambourine. So sorry. Each plays in four parts, and they always include a fight. The puppets are made out of camel or water buffalo hides that are cut and painted. Each one's about 10 to 12 inches tall. Each story features Karagaz and Hashivad, but other characters are frequently involved also. I feel like that's Hashivad. Didn't, didn't put an accent. I don't know. Well, you know. Today, the shadow puppet plays are performed primarily for children. Even though other forms of entertainment have come along for kids, these plays are still popular. A school in Bursa continues to teach the art to future puppeteers. There they are. That's a beautiful style of puppetry, isn't it? They're hanging out. <laughs> Being friends. It looks like. Thinking aloud. Mothers in Turkey begin gathering and making items for their daughters' wedding trousseau from birth. These napkins, linens, towels, underwear, and more are stored for her future marriage till the girl reaches the age of 17. Fathers, on the other hand, prepare for their sons' future weddings by putting away money for a marriage party. They also use the money to help pay for the furniture that the newlywed couple will need. Turkish marriage is truly a family affair, including everyone. There's a little home here. Playing jump rope. 
That game is so fun and so stressful at the same time. And here's a sweet grandma here knitting. A busy day getting off the crowded bus there. Very old fashioned home with a sod roof or hay, it says there. There's a street vendor. It says it's berry juice. I thought these were coffee. How interesting. And yeah, they always put on elaborate ways to pour it out for you and you tip them extra. Housing problems. When the migration from Turkish villages to big cities continued to decline, it was impossible to avoid a shortage of housing. People kept coming. There simply were not enough places for them to live. A solution was found by creating squatter settlements outside the cities. The quickly built shacks became shanty towns, or these, which means built in the night, as the Turks called them. Some sources report that today half of the big cities' residents live in these shacks. So for people living in the shanty towns, life is difficult. Ooh, these look so good. I watch a lot of tourist videos when I research Turkey, and I've seen these in a couple of them. They look so yummy. Let's read about good table manners. Table manners in Turkey are different than those in the United States. Before people begin to eat, the host will say this, which means may it be healthy. Wine is often present at the table, and the host always takes the first sip. Then the host says, to your good honor, the guests reply, health to your hands. It's their way of thanking their host for the food. When company comes over for dinner, the host does not sit down with the guests. Instead, they remain standing to serve them from each dish. When a second helping is offered, the guest is supposed to say no at first and then give in. Reaching across the table is very acceptable. I was about to say there's a lot of cultures that do the Oh no, when they mean yes <laughs> for food. But this reaching across the table, that's a huge no no in the United States. Meals are usually served with these small dishes first, followed by a main dish of meat, salad, and a starch, then a second main course of cold cooked vegetables. Turks tend to have a sweet tooth and are known for their desserts. Many meals end with sweets like rice pudding and then some fresh fruit. When people are finished eating, they place their knives on the right and forks on the left of the plate so that they cross in the middle. I like that. It's like, no. <laughs> no more food. I am full. Let's see. We'll skip. Oh, there's a recipe for shish kebab over there. That sounds really good. A trip to the Grand Bazaar and the Egyptian Spice Market. Turks and foreigners alike appreciate two bazaars located in Istanbul. The Grand Bazaar is more than 500 years old. It has more than 4,000 shops, all under one roof. It is the oldest and largest covered marketplace in the world, with 22 separate entrances. Walking through, it's like walking through a maze. More than 25,000 people work there. The Spice Market, on the other hand, is a noisy, crowded place that specializes in selling spices, herbs, fruits, nuts, and candies. Fishers near the waterfront catch fish for customers and cook it right there on charcoal grills. The smell from the cooking and the spices displayed for sale in large burlap bags is amazing. I'm sure it is. Oh my gosh. They're working hard in school. Hanging out says they're enjoying modern amenities. Oh, she's talking on her phone. That's what we're talking about. This is the last box I remember because it's about the hammams. A refreshing tradition. 2,000 years ago, Turkey had more than 100 hammams. Today, it still has about 100. A hammam is a Turkish bath, and it is a regular part of some Turks' day, and certainly a highlight for visitors. A Turkish bath is a place to go to get clean, to socialize, and to relax. It is usually made up of three separate rooms, with separate sides for men and women. The first room is called the... Oh, it's a... Jason Jamikar. 
This is where people come in and change their clothes. The traditional hammam provides a towel, wooden clogs, and a peshtimal, or sarong. Men wrap these around their waists, and women sometimes wrap them around their upper body. After putting on the peshtimal, Turks take showers and then walk through the second room, the sokukuk, and into the hararet, the hot steam room. This is where the most pleasure can be found. Bathers lie face down on their towels on a heated platform and are given a massage. Sometimes they are rubbed down with a camel's hair brush, which is guaranteed to take off at least one layer of dirt and skin. Hammams are quite beautiful and commonly feature marble tables, brass fixtures, and awe-inspiring doors. Because the Islamic faith puts such an emphasis on cleanliness, even the poor come to the back. Women frequently enjoyed the Turkish baths in the past because they gave them a chance to be in town and to talk with others. Children are usually right alongside their mothers. The hamam is generally the first place a baby is brought after they've reached the 40-day mark. If I remember, I'm going to link it below. I know my hamam Turkish roots because of Whisper Crystal, who was one of the very first ASM artists before the word ASMR existed. It was just whisper videos in the whisper community. And she has a hamam roleplay. And it's incredible. It has put me to sleep for well over 10 years now. I watch it constantly. So, there's a little special corner of my heart for hamams. I love them. But we're going to end it there. After this is just little maps and facts. Thank you so much for watching. I do hope that you found this video to be relaxing and educational. And hey, if you're still awake and you're not subscribed yet and want to see more content like this, consider subscribing. I hope that you have a good, good, good.